last couple of weeks, we've been in a series called uh, Light in, Into Dark Corners. And uh, I've heard from lots of you about your responses to this and questions about this and what God's been doing in your heart on this and lighting things up. And, and, and more and more, uh, I've heard stories or got emails about people you're talking to and people at work uh, or, or friends and that kind of thing. This is, that's exciting to me as we start to apply some of the stuff we've been talking about. A couple of weeks ago, I started this by talking about the caves that uh, my friends and I used to explore near Calgary. And um, what an uncomfortable journey into these caves. It was unbelievably difficult and exhausting just to get up to the caves. But then you get in, and it's so dark, and it gets colder and colder and colder, and then it gets tighter and tighter and tighter and more and more uncomfortable, and then you're crawling on your belly, and in pitch darkness, uh, dropping down a crevasse into another, like, there's so much fear, and there's so much anxiety, and so much unknown in this. But knowing what's there when we get there was mind-blowing. And so you take the right tools. You go with someone who's done it before. You, you know what's coming, and that changes the amount of the fear and the anxiety. And, and, and as we think about that, um, this series, in a sense, let me oversimplify. If you have the light, turn it on. Like, like going through those caves and having the light and not sharing it with the people around us. Let's continue through our journey of life, groppling around in the dark, trying to find our own way. When the truth is, I'm traveling through this anxiety and this unknown and this fear uh, with somebody who's traveled this before and somebody who knows the way and has the light. Uh, I remember when I was a teenager, I, I think my youth pastor described it to me like this about life, especially as a teenager. He said, life some days seemed like it was a long, dark hallway, and all you have to do is get to the other end. But it's dark, and you're feeling your way along this hallway, and along the hallway there's door after door after door after door on both sides. And, and the lights are on behind the door. And you can see light streaming out. You can hear music playing. You can see the shadows of people moving and people laughing. And because I'm trying to get through this long, dark hallway to get to the end, every time I come by one of those doors, I'm super intrigued and attracted to what's in there. But I know, no, I can't do that. I've got to live for God, and I'm going to continue to blade. I've just got to get to the end. Of what's the simple solution to that? Turn the lights on. When you turn the lights on, I can see the reality of where I'm going. I can see the truth that the distractions or the attractions become distractions. And I can see the truth that everybody else is in that hallway trying to navigate it too. And I think it's on us to turn the lights on. I'll come back to that picture in just a minute. Let me pray. And Father in heaven, as we take the next 30 minutes or so to work through some uh, some verses in, in your holy word. God, I pray that you would open our eyes that we could see. God, would you make your word come alive to us? And this is the simplicity of this passage. God, would you stir us, grab our hearts? Again, there's nothing here, Father, that's a guilt trip. This is a beautiful, brilliant picture that you want to compel us towards. Something that you have blessed us with, with brilliance and beauty and hope. God, would you draw us to you, that we would see Jesus clearly. So speak to us. Have your way in here. Fill this room with your spirit so that we all know. Feel free to poke us in the chest or stomp on our toes or push us from behind if we need to. But God, feel free to do your work, probably in each one of us very differently. But would you meet us where we're at this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Quick review of where we've been. We've, if you have a Bible, we're in 2 Corinthians. We've been looking at chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And so the first week, uh, well, let me, before I say that, this, Paul has written three previous letters to the church in Corinth. And in the middle of all of that, there was a falling out because the people in, in Corinth, in Greece, in Greece um, 
the, the Greek culture and the Greek way of thinking has kind of infiltrated their thinking again, not unlike us today, that they became really enamored with the celebrity type person, the really charismatic speaker, the, the, the good looking, the, the brilliant, the, the, the leader, and, and, they, and this kind of thinking uh, kind of infiltrates the whole culture. And so the people in the church started thinking less and less of the Apostle Paul because he was short, not real attractive, not a great speaker, he was poor, he acted more like a servant than a leader, and they kind of got really disenfranchised with his leadership. And so they were sorting through all of those problems, and part of this letter in, in 2 Corinthians, which I said a couple of weeks ago is actually should be 4 Corinthians, but it's, the only sec, it's only the second one we have in our Bible. Uh, he, he, they're reconciling these differences, but he's kind of, in a sense, trying to reestablish uh, his leadership, his authentically following Jesus, and, and, and their authentic witness in their world. And so um, that's kind of where we've been in the last couple of weeks. We looked at the light into the dark corners with the fear and the unknown and the confusion and the trust I want to go with someone who's been there, who knows the way. So um, in the last couple of weeks, we had uh, Gerald Hogenberg here who talked about what was happening over in the Middle East and how, how in that dark corner of the world, God's light is actually shining brightly. And there's so much happening. And we don't hear about that in the news. I love the fact he says, don't believe everything you hear in the news about what's happening through the Middle East because God is alive and well. The churches are thriving. And two weeks ago, we looked at chapters one, uh, chapter 2 in 2 Corinthians. We talked about being the aroma of Christ. We talked about how, how God has set up you as a love letter from God to the people around you and how to live that way. Last week we skipped and we went to chapter 5. In the beginning of chapter 6, we looked at how God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, uh, reconciling people to people, reconciling people to God, most importantly. And he's, he's given us that message and entrusted that message to us. It's on us. And we are to be ambassadors of Christ. Today I want to come to the middle section of that. I want to look at chapter 3 and 4. And I've done it out of order on purpose, and I think you'll see why. Um, but in this middle section, uh, Paul, in a sense, is talking about uh, people's ability to see in the dark. And, and like in the cave, we can grapple around in the darkness and try to find our way in fear and anxiety and, and, the, and the unknown. Uh, but he's given us light. And how do we actually help people who can't see? Uh, he starts chapter 3 by explaining it in the context of the Jewish religious history in their context. And he's talking about their old covenant before Christ, and then the new covenant that came after Christ. And, and, and the way he says that is this old covenant, the, the law, the do's and don'ts, the, the, the strict laws about every little aspect of your life, the sacrifices, the things you had to do and do and do, and the places you had to be, and amounts you had to give, and all of this. And he says that was a, a great thing to point us into relationship with God, but what it did is it became uh, uh, not a relationship with God, it became an illegal agreement between people and God, and grew cold, and actually drew people away from hope because they can't do it. And it became a covenant of death, it says in the New Testament. And he, he contrasts that with when Jesus came and changed the whole deal and gave a new covenant, a new covenant based on love, based on his death as a gift, and the hope, and the brilliance, and the beauty, and the simplicity of that. And the outcome of that is hope. There's a problem. There's a problem. And the problem is people can't see it. People can't see it. It explains that using the, the, the visual illustration of a veil. Okay, so join me. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to start reading at verse 12. And I'm not going to read through the whole thing all at once. I'm going to go little chunk by little chunk, and I have lots of comments and things. And if I get too far off, we'll run out of time. 
but we should be okay. Starting at verse 12. If you don't have a Bible, there's lots of them at the back. Feel free to go up and grab one. I will put some of the scripture on the screen to help you follow along. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. He's talking about this hope and this brilliance and this glory. He says, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face so the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to the end. Moses was up the mountain with God, got the Ten Commandments. And it says, it says in, back in Exodus, he came down from the mountain and he was radiant. He was glowing. And you can imagine the people are looking at him. Their mouths are wide open. And they're staring at it. That's the word gaze. He's trying to stop them. He put this veil over his face for a couple of reasons. One, because they're staring at him. And it's distracting for what he wants to do. But, but because he was in the presence of God and he's radiant, the longer he wasn't in the presence of God like that, it was fading and he didn't want to see the people that, he didn't want the people to see that it was fading. Now think about this. Moses was in the presence of God. And was radiant. As soon as you saw him, you knew it. Translate that to today. The New Testament tells us that the presence of God is in you. You're not in the presence of God. The presence of God is in you. How much more should we be radiant? We walk in the room and people should see it right away. And know the difference. Because we've been in the, we are in the presence of God. The presence of God is in us. How much greater is that? So, so here with Moses, the glory is fading, but he's got a veil over his face to, to, stop, people, um, to stop people from staring at him. Verse 14. Their minds were hardened. For to this day when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. So he flips it around here, and now there's a veil over people's eyes. So they can't see. So that every time, even today, when, when, when the Jewish nation reads their scripture, when they read the books of Moses and the law and the prophets, it says there's a veil over their eyes. To put it bluntly, the truth is right there. And they are not capable of seeing it. Think about that. It's like they're wearing a hood. And they can read it. They can't see it. This, the, the scripture clearly all the way through the Old Testament points to Jesus. When we read it, as he says here, with the veil removed, we can see Jesus on every page of the Old Testament, how it points to him. But that veil is there. They're blinded. Where did it leave off? Their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Jesus it is taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. They can't see it. They're actually not capable of seeing it. That's a critical point. You think about the people you go to work with or go to school with or people who live down the street. And unless Jesus has removed that veil, the truth could be right in front of them and they won't see it. They won't see it. Here's a problem. You've probably seen this graphic before. Right? It, the bridge here, uh, man is on one side, separated from God. The chasm in the middle is sin, and Jesus bridges the gap. This is pretty easy to understand, and the truth is, this is not very descriptive of our world anymore. Because this, this assumes that humans are right on the precipice, and they understand the chasm, and they see God, and I can't get there. Today, it's probably more like this. Because our average person in, in our world isn't standing there going, boy, God seems so far away. How do I get to God? There's something in the way. They're way over here, not even looking that direction. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So before we can even get them to have a conversation about God and the chasm and the sin in Jesus, we got to go way back over here and start pointing in the direction of, they got to start looking in the right direction. Does that make sense? Okay, look at what we've talked about the last couple of weeks. Being the aroma of Christ. Being a love letter from God to people. Being messengers of reconciliation, ambassadors of Christ. We're way over there with them. And we've got to start pointing people in the right direction so that they can actually get to the place where they can start seeing. That's a whole different conversation, isn't it? Imagine that you went to the doctor and the doctor says to you, you're pregnant. Okay, before that, imagine you were all women and you went to the doctor and the doctor says you're pregnant. And then the first thing he says is, push! That's a, that conversation's going to happen. But that conversation is a long way away still. Folks, when we're talking to our friends about Jesus, we've got a million conversations that have to happen before we can get to the end. And I think when we look at this graphic, that's a really good picture for me. How do we actually get to turn them in the right direction first? The world has changed. But people are not that different. Forty years ago... I would say in Canada, most of the people had an understanding and some kind of experience and base ground that, that is more like they're standing at the edge of that, knowing God is there and I can't get there. We're not like that today. Where did I leave off? Verse 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Here's a problem. If they're that far away from even acknowledging that God is there or a desire to know God or even see him, how do we get to the place where someone can turn to the Lord so the veil's removed? But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That, what's the implications of that? So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So where the Spirit of the Lord isn't, when I'm standing that far on the other side, the implication then is there's bondage. I'm locked up. There's darkness. My ability and capabilities to see in the light and all that kind of stuff is, re- is limited. It's limited. In verse 18... And we all, with unveiled faces, who can behold the glory of God, we can see because the veil's been lifted because of Jesus. We are being transformed into the same image to some degree or another. We're becoming more and more and more like Jesus because we can see the truth of who Jesus is. And this comes from the Spirit of the Lord. Now look at the first word in chapter 4. Therefore. Okay, given all of this, now what? Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. Have we? We refuse to practice cunning or tampering with God's word. I know a guy who one time started taking pages out of his Bible that weren't going to apply to his life. I think we do that not literally, right? But there's, other, there's pages in our Bible that we don't go to or we don't adhere to. I know God says this, but we don't tamper with God's word. But by, an, by the open statement of truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. We become ridiculously vulnerable to people. That's hard in our world. Because we are so closed off. We protect ourselves. We protect our reputation. What other people think is so important. This says, this says, because he's given us this ministry, we don't lose heart. We've, our lives are dramatically changed. Our behavior is dramatically changed. We're becoming more like Jesus. And we become ridiculously vulnerable to other people in front of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled only to those who are perishing. If the gospel is veiled, 
If this is somebody who can wave the truth right in front of their eyes and they can't get it, they can't see it, it doesn't make sense, they're dying. They're perishing. In their case, this is verse 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this world has blinded them. They cannot see who Jesus is. They can't see the love of Jesus. They can't see what God is doing in the world. They can't see that this is good news. Jesus isn't relevant. He's irrelevant. Jesus maybe isn't even a real figure in history. They can't even see that. They're not capable because... Satan, the God of this world, has put blinders on them. Now, you've probably all seen a horse that's attached to a carriage and they're driving and they're in the city. What, what does the horse have on? Blinders, right? And, and they put blinders on the horse so they can't see peripherally, so they don't get distracted. But somebody's put that on. And that's a lot of ways a picture that I have of this. The enemy, Satan, the God of this world, has put blinders on people. They can't see. Maybe. Maybe this is the first step in all of this, is beginning to pray. Because if he has made them, if he has rendered people incapable of seeing the truth, where do we start? We start by praying that God would open their eyes to remove that veil so they could see. Folks, then we can start having conversations, right? Then we can start having conversations. Let me stop and collect my thoughts here. Without Christ, people are blinded in their minds. They can't see that Christ is valuable or relevant or necessary. They can't see that maybe even Christ is real. You could have the good news and the truth of the entire history of the world and the future of everything. The truth could be laid out right in front of it, and they can't see it. So if they're going to receive the truth, they can't see any value in it. John Piper said this, a miraculous work of God is needed in their lives to open their eyes so they can see and then even begin to recognize that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the God, the Lord, Savior, and the real treasure of our lives. Maybe this is where we really need to start praying. Start praying for our town and for our cities and our neighbors and our friends. Okay, we see the problem, right? Spiritually blinded, not able to see. But we don't stop here. We don't stop here. We, we talked a couple of weeks ago, last week in chapter 5, verse 11, it says, so we persuade people. But persuading is going to do not a lot of good if they're blinded, right? But we persuade people. Look at verse 5, back in chapter 4. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord. Go back to what I said before about the, the Corinthians in this Greek culture. And, and, and the great leaders were the ones who were, were big and muscular and strong and good looking and great orators and great thinkers and they were charismatic and people would follow them. He says here, we're not proclaiming ourselves. This isn't about me. It's not about my knowledge. It's not about your charisma or your ability to speak in public. It's not about how much people love you. It's not about your Bible knowledge or your thinking or your engagement. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Verse 5 and 6. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ, our Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. For God said, let light shine out of darkness. Sorry, the God who said... Let light shine out of darkness on the day of creation, day one. He has shone in our hearts and give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God 
in the face of Jesus. The same God who created light on day one is the one who puts the light in our hearts. So, it says, we can see Jesus. So we can know who Jesus really is. So we, be, we can begin to see it. We can begin to think about it. We can begin to recognize that. To see Jesus for who he really is. When we start to see that, then we can begin to think about receiving the gift and the treasure. Now, folks, that's what I want for my kids. Whether they're 6 or 16 or 28, it's what I want for my parents, for my neighbors, for my co-workers, for my relatives, for my friends. We want the light to shine in their hearts so they can really see and then receive Christ. We want them to be reconciled with God. So each week, we've looked at this same verse from Matthew chapter 5. How do we do that? How do we do that? On one hand, it's ridiculously simple. On the other hand, it's impossible. I think we have to start by praying that God opens the eyes of people around us. People who can't see, can't hear. If somebody can't see, if somebody can't hear, how could we use another scent? Another sense. I gave it away by saying scent, didn't I? Didn't we look at being the aroma of Christ? This is a full body picture. This isn't just talking. It's not just living so they can see. It's me, all of me, being a light of Christ in the lives, engaged in the lives of people so they can see it, they can hear it, they can smell it, they can taste it. We have to live like a love letter from God. And he, as he opens their eyes, removes that veil, then we speak and we point to Jesus. We have that message of reconciliation. In Acts chapter 26, this is back to the Apostle Paul, and he's in jail, and uh, he's been pulled out on trial in front of King Agrippa. And he's telling his whole story in his defense uh, about how uh, uh, Jesus stopped him on the road to Damascus and, and told him he's persecuting him, he blinded him, sent him to Damascus. And look, look at what Jesus says here. It says, uh, in 26 verse 16, it says, Get up, because I've appeared to you for a purpose, to appoint you as a servant, to declare what you have seen. I'm sending you, verse 18, 17 and 18, I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they could receive forgiveness for sins and a place among those whom God has sanctified. Jesus says to Paul, and he says this in defense on court for why he's doing what he's doing. He's in jail because he's going around preaching about Christ. His defense is, Jesus himself told me my job is to go open the eyes of people so they can see the truth. Think about that. Paul was a Pharisee. He knew the entire Old Testament by heart. He knew every prophecy about, about the Messiah coming. He waited for that. He taught that. He got that in understanding. And all of a sudden, in a sense, when the scales fell from his eyes... All that stuff that he had studied and memorized came into focus. And immediately then, when God lifted the veil, he could see how all of that fit together, how it perfectly pointed to Jesus. And his entire life became about telling people, we know all of this. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. His entire life he was sent to turn people uh, to the light let me go back to the dark cave for a second. In that cave, it was ridiculously dark. Honestly, without any exaggeration, you could not tell if your hand was right here. It's that dark. And in that context, you can't see. There's fear, anxiety, there's mistrust, there's confusion. You don't know which way is back and which way is forward. You're feeling your way along. 
But folks, you've got the flashlight. And if there was four of you on that journey and you've got the flashlight and you're hiding it, what's happening there? You've been there before. You know the spectacular stuff that's in the back of that cave. And the whole journey to get there is difficult and, 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 and painful and anxious. And there's fear involved. And these guys are trusting you. And folks, this, this is a, what a great parallel to life. But we know what's there. I can't even see it unless my light is on. I love it how, how, and the Apostle Paul describes it in Acts chapter 26. We know that it's God that opens the eyes. But God sent him to the open the eyes. And there's this partnership happening. God's plan is to use us in that process. Anybody here feel like they're adequate for that? I'm perfectly fit for that. I'm suited for that. Because I am the knight in shining armor that was God's soldier and I'm wonderful and perfect and I have the charisma and the ability to speak and I, everybody loves me. You know what? There's not one of us that feels fit to be God's messenger. God has given each one of us our own little uh, circle of friends and, and, and influence. Uh, probably some of those people will overlap, overlap with other people's circle of influence. But there's a certain amount of people where we have God has put us there to be that light, to be that influence, to point to Jesus. And um, God lifts the blindness and gives us the flashlight. I find myself praying more and more that, that God would fill our church with a passion, a real passion for spreading the light. Look at verse 7. Back in 2 Corinthians. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power that belongs to God, not to us. I don't think there's any of us that feel fit or sufficient, good enough, knowledgeable enough, confident enough to be that. That's God's plan. Because if you have all of that confidence and knowledge and boldness and excitement and I'm the man, let me go, uh, that's probably not where God wants you. Because it's in humility and servanthood and desperation for Jesus, in, in, in feeling inadequate and not confident, you're in exactly the place Jesus wants you to be for this job. Because it's about him and about his empowering and his opportunity and his light and he puts us there. He calls it jars of clay. This phenomenal treasure and brilliance of the truth of God. He puts in jars of clay. Clay breaks. Clay dries out. Right? Clay is not permanent. I love that picture because we are not the gold. God is the gold. We are the, the messengers. We are the, the, the carrier. So if we feel average or below average, um, perfect. Because what God wants from us is authenticity, almost an earthiness, a grass level, basic, simple, humble. So be encouraged if you are an average person, because that's exactly where God wants you to be. For the greatest work of the world, carrying the treasure of Christ, surrounded by people in our unique sphere of influence, when I talk about this, what, what happens in your heart? My guess is some of you, the first things are fear and lack of confidence, uh, intimidation, uncertainty. For some of you, there is hope and trust. For some of you, uh, as we talk about this, God begins to break our hearts for specific people who need to know Jesus. But, but my question is, what does God do in your heart when we talk about this? Where's Caleb? Caleb, come on up and join me up here. Uh, many of you know Caleb. Caleb is a board member in our church. And uh, I, I asked Caleb if he would join me up here um, just for a couple of minutes. 
Let me ask you first, what in the last six months or a year, what has God been stirring in your heart? Uh, God's been stirring a lot of things. So as God's been working in your heart and bringing this, to, uh, what, what are you doing about that? Um, I decided to support um, what you're allowing me to share my faith uh, simply, effectively, biblically, biblically, the way Jesus did. And <coughs> now I'm using that to uh, uh, share the good news with uh, friends, strangers, family, uh, co-workers. So uh, Caleb has been online in the Billy Graham School of Evangelism and taking courses uh, because he felt like he needed training and to learn. Uh, he just initiated that himself. Hey, we talked about um, conversations you've been having and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, what do you think is, are the number one things that are holding people back from actually being this? Where do you think God's taking this? Is this starting in you? Probably the same kind of things have been stirring in other people. What do you, what's God going to do with this? What do you think? Um, I think God's showing us that we need to self help this year and in this year. <coughs> Hostility in the, world, in the world regarding politics, religion, spiritual things, and <coughs> the freedom of speech. Right on. Thanks for coming and doing this. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate this. I love what God is doing in his heart. And <laughs> and responding in to what God is doing in his heart to, to actually get busy doing stuff. As simple as it is. And, and, and thank you, Caleb. Not everybody... Uh, actually likes getting up in front of people. Some weirdos like me do. But, but it's, that's, it, you know, thanks for coming up and doing that. And then that's hard just in itself. But one of the things I like about this is it, it, Caleb's just, just a normal guy. Um, lots of feelings of in, in, inadequacy and un, not enough knowledge. Uh, he, he's not like, you know, like the super eloquent public speaker, like, the, do you know what I mean? Way to go if you're normal, and you're average, or you feel like you're below average or incapable, because that's what God wants to use. God wants to empower you in that. Are there others here that God has been stirring in your hearts to? My guess is that there is. And maybe, here's what I'll do. I'm, I know I'm, my time is almost up here. Maybe here's what I'll do. If God is stirring in your heart with this stuff too, maybe take one of the cards from the chair, write your name on it, and stick it in the lighthouse at the back. Because I, I'm not going to maybe do anything, maybe I will, but what I want to do is I want to begin to start praying. Because I think God is going to do something out of all of this. And, and I've said a lot of times there are hundreds of people within walking distance of our church that are dying without Jesus. And we say on our sign that we are a beacon of hope to the shores of Lake Huron. Are we? I think God wants to do some real work here. And it's not about a building project. It's not about expanding our church. This is the kingdom of God. And the number one role, our mission 
is to reach people, to take the light into dark. If you're looking for training or learning, uh, there's lots of stuff available like that. I'll put one more plug in for the Right Now Media that Ken talked about. In a couple of weeks, you get an email with a code that will allow you to sign up for that and get it and for free. If you go in there and you type evangelism in the search thing, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of training things, of courses, of Bible studies, just for training and learning. This is, this is going to be a phenomenal tool for us. Let me, let me go back here and finish quickly. Verse 13, skip to verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believe, and so I spoke. We believe, so we speak, knowing that he who raised Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us into God's presence. We cannot avoid the speaking part. That's part of this process. When we close ourselves off, when, when, when my faith is just between me and God, or when people on my street become projects, we're losing it. And I, I know some of you are fantastic listeners, and you can have a conversation with people, and you come away knowing all kinds of details and remembering, and you've connected dots. And some of us are not good listeners because we're more worried about how we're going to respond or what I'm going to say next when they close their mouth, and it's my turn to talk. Uh, we have all kinds here, but let me encourage you. This speaking part starts with listening. I think five times this week already I've said this. You have two ears and one mouth. Use them proportionately. But we've got to use the mouth part. We need to be speaking the truth. And how do we do that? Here's a simple thing. We need to start listening to people's stories. Because when we know God's story and we start hearing people's story, we will begin to see where they've already overlapped. That God has been active in their lives already and we'll start to look for those. When, when, when you and I meet and we start talking, we're really fast and easy and quick at figuring out where our stories overlap and we can talk about those things like that, right? We're pretty much all really good at that. We can talk about the Raptors game last night. Or we can talk about the, the, the maple leaves or the weather or the Sable Beach and the sunsets. So we can find those things. Our lives overlap really fast. Let's get good at listening to people's stories and finding ways where their story overlaps with God's story and overlaps with our story. And let's start conversations there. That's easy. That's natural. That's not forcing anything. That's not swinging a two-by-four or hitting people with the Bible. That's listening to people actually engaging in their stories and in their lives. My uncle was a missionary in Chad in East Africa for 40 years. And what his job was, uh, he was brilliant with languages, and he would go in with other missionaries. But his job was to go into these little tribes and learn the language, develop an alphabet and writing for it, teach the people to read, and translate the Bible. And he did that seven times in different villages. He told me all kinds of stories about that and his team members he worked with and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but he said they went to one village where there had been missionaries there for their entire career and there was not one believer. And as he came in with these other team of missionaries and they set up their houses and started living among these people, People started giving their lives to Christ. And the thing that they, I've heard this phrase from other missionaries too. But my uncle said, what they said was, he's been here for 35 years. And we loved what he talked about. But if we could have actually seen a Christian, then we would have believed it. We don't let that become us. Either we're all live, live, live and no talk, or we're all talk, talk, talk and no live. Folks, this is, it, it, it doesn't separate. It doesn't separate. And we are far from perfect. Like we said at the beginning, what Paul wanted more than anything else to is to, is to authentically represent Jesus. All right. We started talking about the caves. The people we walk along in life with don't know about the afterlife. There's anxiety. The fear of death is ridiculous. 
the, the, the lack of uh, relevance of Jesus, to be able to trust him with my life, these things are crazy and difficult. And, and yet we've been there. We have the light. And we know that the most spectacular things are coming. But people are not capable of seeing. So let me challenge you with this. Are you a tour guide or a travel agent? Because a travel agent sits in his office, has got all the pamphlets, and somebody comes in and says, we want to go, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you could go here, you could go here, you could go here. And they'll do all the work, and they'll come back and sign you up for the trip. That's a travel agent, right? That doesn't work here. A tour guide, somebody comes in, we book the trip, I jump in the boat with you, and we go down the river. Huge difference. This isn't your journey you're taking somebody else on. It's their journey. And we can use our experience and our input and our knowledge and the light of Christ to walk with people to their journey. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 5, and let me end with that. Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, so it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, it's confusing, but I'll say thank you for choosing to use us. As imperfect as we are, jars of clay, as, as, without confidence, without knowledge, without charisma, without connections, without confidence in fear and anxiety and all those kind of things ourselves, uh, I am just as desperate for Jesus as everybody here. God, thank you for choosing to use us as partners in your plan. But God, would you stir in us a passion for the people who are stuck in the darkness? Would you use us as light into the dark corners? As you open their eyes, we're right there. And we've been in a million conversations already. God, may we point to Jesus well. So we ask for you to give us a huge awakening in our area. That lights would go on all over the place. That there would be an eagerness and an anticipation and a drawing together towards you. And God, put us right in the middle of that. we have the hope that's in Jesus. Amen.